conversations today, my guest has made India his home for more than 45 years. His aesthetic is bred of a gentle simplicity, harmonizing with nature, and a profound social consciousness. I'm delighted to welcome a legendary architect of our times, Joseph Allen Stein. Welcome, Mr. Stein. Thank you. Uh, in, 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 in a rare honor for a foreign citizen, you were given a Padma Shri some time ago, and you have virtually made India your home. Uh, how Indian do you feel? In I, what ways? I never think of myself that way or not that way. I think of myself as an Earthian. That's an expression I borrowed from Buckminster Fuller. In what ways do you think of yourself as an Earthian? I think that's a lovely turn of phrase. Because, because I think we have, I think nationalism diminishes us. In what ways does nationalism diminish us? Well, first place in the, in the fact that the principle of human activity is war. In what ways do you begin to relate this larger vision and philosophy to your work? Well, that's a huge question. Our, and architecture is a huge subject. It embraces everything from the design of a bathroom to a town plan. Uh, most of my work has been in fairly isolated situations. My principal interest and concern over the last several decades has been the deterioration of mountain environment. And many of my activities the last years have been involved in working in the mountains, particularly in Kashmir, but Bhutan also. You told me sort of just before we started the recording that you were, you were sort of passionately concerned about what was happening in Kashmir and, and, and hoping that, that things would, would settle down and, and open up, perhaps. Uh, what kind of concerns do you have about Kashmir? Well, I, I'm an architect, <clears throat> and my competence is very limited. The, so my concerns are primarily environmental. But of course, but of course, any, any, any situation involves the social as well. You brought in a sort of an American heritage of architecture uh, into India. In what ways did you feel you needed to modify that uh, for it to be appropriate to Indian conditions? Well, whether it's America or whether it's Southern Europe or Northern Europe or India, uh, the regional aspect is always a uh, critical aspect. Uh, the experiment in universalism and architecture produced, you might say, mixed results. I'm t referring to the international style. But, uh, but the international style was also based on many uh, very positive uh, pr principles. It was insensitive to regional possibilities, and, and therefore, in the end, it became efficient but boring. Uh, now, the opposite of the international style, style was perhaps represented by the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, which, which was modern but, re but regional, and regional not defined necessarily in terms of a nation, but in terms of a specific location, a specific culture, a specific aspect of nature. And if, and if one really considers it, you find that regional ar architecture has always been regional. Japanese, Persian, Greek, they're all very different. But they're, they're all different because they respond had a different natural setting, and they responded differently to it, they had different possibilities of use of material. You can't conceive as an example of uh, Japanese temples or pagodas or roofs 
being Im imagined or designed by anyone who hadn't seen the, the, the great pine trees and forests. You can't conceive of anyone designing the marvelous domes and intricate geometric patterns of Persian architecture who, ha who hadn't seen the, the, the grandeur and simplicity of the desert. So, so the real issue is response to the environment. With the enormous diversity of India, uh, climatically, culturally, uh, is, is there a sense of, 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 of a commonality of, uh, that, or a thread that goes through Indian architecture? In the by and large, Indian architecture has never been very involved with structure. It's a very rich country from the point of view of materials. And the approach to design is a very, very rich and complex approach based not so much on structure as on, you might say, aesthetic response. You take Kajaraho as an example. It, it, it teems with the life of the jungle teams with life in every aspect. And it's an audacious echoing of the mountains in stone. But it has very little to do with uh, economy of structure. Whereas many architectures are based upon structural logic. Take the Gothic architecture of Europe, the Greek architecture and the Japanese architecture. But the Indian architecture is basically sculptural. You've created some sort of wonderful structures in, 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 in the middle of urban centers. Um, how have you sort of reconciled this? The culture of a place is also important. The, what, pe what people see and feel is important. So there, there are two, two elements that come together, but are from widely divergent beginnings. One, one, one is the, the cultural response to environment, and the other is the structural possibilities and, re, and requirements. Uh, now, in modern times, we've developed a whole new vocabulary of possibilities of structure. In fact, with, with new materials, steel, plastic, and so on. And at the same time, we have eyes that are conditioned by memories of their past and the relationship to the environment we we occupy. So, uh, so every situation is more or less a particular and peculiar one. If one is adequately informed and adequately sensitive, then they react to, to, to the site and the conditions of the site and the culture of the site. Watching in conversations today with Joseph Stein. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. You live in, in, and work in Delhi, and, and for most people, the perception of a city like Delhi is, is one that's uh, decaying, uh, is, 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 is a new culture of, of, of aggressiveness, of competitiveness, of disregard for the environment, of consumerism. Uh, as a sensitive architect, how do you go about developing a building that, 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 that is acceptable and responsive, in a sense, to a culture which is contrary to your own wellspring of inspiration? Well, the, the bigger issue is scale. Delhi is an impossible scale now. And it, it has produced impossible problems, literally impossible, it cannot be solved. Uh, and it's plunging ahead with little awareness of the ha hazards so many voices have been raised. 
Now, I'll give you one, one example. Uh, De Delhi at the airport is 617 feet above sea level. From the airport to the Bay of Bengal, which is where the water flows, is 800 miles. Now, if you work out the mathematics of that, there's a slope for carrying the water of 1 to 8,000. Now, the, t the top of a table is not level to an accuracy of 1 to 8,000. When we, w when we design a flat roof and we want to know which way the water will go so it will go into the gutter, we have to make a slope of 1 to 80. And here the slope, the natural slope, is 1 to 8,000. Now, the biggest construction activities in India and, and among the biggest in the world is the development of the East Delhi, which is in the floodplain at the meeting of the Jamna and the Hindon. And you know, already na 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 nature has warned some several years ago, Maharani Bagh was flooded to a depth of a more, more, probably two feet. Now, there's immense construction is going on with almost no regard for the fact that the rivers are silting up, that the waterways are becoming obstructed by in, in, in encroachments of one sort or another, but primarily that the, that the rivers are silting up. Already the rivers have silted up so much that the tributaries of the Ganges leading are now, the bottom of the river bed is higher than the adjoining ground, and the water is only contained by the dikes. When the dikes break, all the water floods into the villages nearby. Wouldn't you say uh, people, in a sense, get the city they deserve, like they get governments they deserve? Uh, I'd rather not try to answer that. I, but I do think that we are struggling with a problem of scale, which makes everything very difficult. Delhi is now, now so big and so crowded that no good solution is affordable. You came to India more than 45 years ago, and you were inspired by the vision of Gandhi and Tagore and the passion of Nehru. Uh, in, in what ways has India changed for you? And, and, and what has kept you here? Well, I'm, I'm, I mentioned to you, I think of myself as an Earthian. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter to me very much whether I'm here or in San Francisco from the, that point of view. I stayed here largely with the influence of my wife. She felt this was a good place for our children to grow up. Why? That I'm not going to go into. <laughs> That's a complex subject. But she felt that it was a good thing for them to grow up in a less competitive atmosphere than San Francisco, which is their home. You've been um, an, 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 an inspiration for um, so many young architects. Who have been your inspirations? Well, that's an easy question, fine. <laughs> uh, I had the good fortune to have studied under a number of people whom I greatly respected and learned from. And it's a rare, rare good fortune for a young man to have teachers here whom he can respect. I studied with Elio Sarn in the Finn, Car Carl Millis, sculptor, a Swede. Uh, I worked for Richard Neutra, an Austrian. And I studied with Aero Sarn, and, as I mentioned. And above all, 
I've been inspired by the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Sullivan, who was his master. Uh, beyond, of course, the, the impact of materials, uh, is, 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 there a, is, there, is there a modern Indian school of architecture? Uh, probably there's one forming now. There, it doesn't exist yet, but it's perhaps forming. The fact is there must be nearly a hundred schools of architecture now. And out of the activity of these thousands of new graduates, certainly something is, is forming. So you can you can recognize, shall I say, the Indian touch at the same, same time the modern touch. I think of all the architects I know, Charles Correa represents a remarkable balance of technical capability and, cu and cultural uh, integration. You're watching In Conversations today with Joseph Stein. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, let's take you back to, 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 to the process of, of creating a building. How does it all, all, all begin for you? You know, I'm a client, and I, and I come and I say, I have um, a thousand square meters of land, and uh, will you build me a build, Mr. Stein? Because I, you're the best. Where do we go from there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I need it for... Well, for a, building, a building can be looked at several ways. First place, it's an abstract uh, problem. Of, of, of shelter, of adjustment to the climate, of structural efficiency, and so forth. Again, it's a reaction to a cultural impression or opportunity. Uh, so, so these two, two elements come together. One is the structural logic, and, 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 the, and the other is the cultural or aesthetic response. Now, the cultural or the aesthetic response can be from different levels. It can be a response to the site. It can be a response to the personality of, of a client. It can be from, from any of many sources, or it can be with a, just a response to the spirit of the times. But it's a complex thing. It's, there, there are many elements in it. How often are you able to sort of make, make a structure, or make the building that you want? I'll, put, I'll answer that a little differently. I've never been able to do a good job except for a good client. And what the comes client's input is also important. And what constitutes a good client? One who encourages you to do your best and doesn't thwart you from do, doing it. Would you define, you know, what a good structure is when you're sort of driving down the street or entering an office complex or a home? Uh, what are the elements that you look for that, 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 that suggest to you, well, this is a well-designed building? Well, that, that's a very personal thing. What one can re react in many ways depending upon what their own values are. Now, to me, the charm of working in India has been largely that this is the place where one could s seek beauty with simplicity. And, that, and, and I think the great inspirations of being in India are not only the, the, the geography, the physical, but the, but the cultural background. I don't, I don't think I would have wanted to stay in India if India hadn't produced people like, say, Tagore and Gandhi. What have you sort of uh, learned from them? In what ways have Tagore and Gandhi inspired you? What about them has, has, has given you this sort of impetus to stay on, perhaps? Well, 
Well, G Gandhi had a... People who were involved are trying to understand the philosophy of people like Gandhi, not necessarily Gandhi's own philosophy, seek beauty through simplicity. They see beauty in simplicity. Other people see beauty in ostentation. And Tagore? Tagore was a very rich person, personality, but basically also a very human, very close to nature, very, very rich personality, very much like, say, Frank Lloyd Wright was a rich personality. Too, too complex for me to try to describe in words. Well, I should sort of suggest that uh, you know the, these these are qualities that people ascribe to your own work. Um, what aspirations do you have for yourself? What are you working on now? What are your passions that drive you at this time in your life? Uh, that's a hard question. I should have to reflect upon that. Uh, I suppose the thing that comes to my mind first, but not necessarily the most important, is, that, is the ecological tragedy that is building up, and which is, to a large extent, needless. Are we now sort of doomed to live uh, in, 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 in these suffocating, deteriorating, decaying environments? I'm not. I, I'm certainly not questioning the, the value and the importance of cities, but we have to find uh, an affordable form for, this, for the city. Now, as a little quirk, I happen to be working on the problem of the vertical garden. Gardens used to be mainly an affair of horizontal dimensions. But we all feel the need to have nature, or be close to nature, or the relief. And so I've, I've noticed that in my work in India, I've taken an old uh, architectural device, which is a planting box with a windowsill, and developed it into an architectural element. Then I, w I was struck with the fact that most architecture in the past in, incorporated nature in the form of sculpture, repre sculptural representations of nature, whether it's a Hindu temple or a, or a Greek column. The forms are, are abstractions of natural forms. Uh, now, today we have water on the top floor and pumps and all of that. So the, the problem, problem of retaining the garden as part of the culture of cities, I think is a very important one. But I don't, I don't offer it as a solution. The culture of cities has to be within the limits of a possible scale. I would, I would say the Huge investments that are being made in infrastructure today are being, in the by and large, spent in the direction of compounding the problem rather than solving it. If I were to offer any suggestion, it is that what, in, what, what the environmental need is thousands of new cities of smaller size. Stein, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.